Hey guys, Kathy Rankin here with BrickHouse.TV. And as usual, we're coming to you from BLK Live. We have a great show tonight with Last in Line. And I'm here with three... It's kind of like a rock god trifecta. I've got... Oh, <laughs> oh my god. You like that? You can use that later. Like rock god uh, <laughs> hat trick. Rock god hat trick. Yeah. Okay, well, it's kind of a bucket list yeah. thing for me. I was, I was a big Dio fan. We've got an original... Founding member helped write a lot of the songs, not just playing. Um, Vinny Apice. Thank you for saying the name right. And yes, take notes, everybody. And then we have Andrew Freeman, who's come in as a vocalist, uh, which I want to talk to you about All right. coming into this band and some of the other stuff you've done. And then we have Phil. Do you go by Phil or Philip? Phil. Anybody Susan. Phil? It's my mom. Oh, so I can't take that. I can't. If you want, but Phil is better. Oh, okay, and Phil <laughs> does bass in the band. Um, guys, so first of all, I want to I want to ask you about on your website it says in 2011 this started just as a jam session. But what I'm trying to wrap my head around is musicians of your caliber, you're all busy with other projects, you don't need to do this. Whose idea was it to actually do a jam session and did you kind of know going in you wanted to do something more with it? Jimmy. <laughs> was it Jimmy? Uh well, Jimmy Bean, I think, got in touch with Viv, and they were talking, and then Viv called me and said, hey, uh, yeah. talking to Jimmy, you want to get together and jam some of the old songs, just for, have a laugh and stuff? I said, yeah. So we got together at this rehearsal place, just the three of us, and we were playing the old song, and we, we were having a laugh because we couldn't remember certain parts of them. Viv's trying to learn the solos again, and it was, it was a good time. So then... Uh, Viv said, well, why don't we do it next week? I said, cool. And then he was, Andy was in town, and we played together before. And I called him. I said, hey, you know, you want to come down? You know some Dio songs. You know, it, wasn't that, it wasn't that personal. He didn't call me. He emailed me. <laughs> I sent him a, 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 a text Western message. Union, or Western Union. <laughs> Western a Union. cablegram. Yeah. Cable, or, yeah, singergram. <laughs> so he sent a raven. <laughs> a homing pigeon. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, yeah. it's a Dio band, you know? Yeah, so yeah. He said to Reed, You're very technical. Yeah. So, Andy, Andy said, I said, why don't you come back, come down and sing? Because really, I could play with you guys. Oh. <laughs> oh. You're going to start a war already? Oh. No, he didn't say that. He came in in full force with the same shit out of those songs. Yeah. And, you know, I heard him sing before, so I, I was blown away. But then Viv was like, oh my God, and Jimmy, too. And then, uh, from that, we well, we do a couple of gigs, you know. And so it really did just start that casual, and then sort of evolved on its yeah, own. The way it should start. It wasn't mm -hmm. a paper band where you go, well, this guy's from this band, and you know, put four guys together that played in other bands and tried to make something happen. This was really organic. organic. Mm -hmm. Did you say organic? I was just going to say uh, organic. Ooh, what a word. <laughs> we are organic. You guys should go on a date. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. See, so it was just magic that just happened. It's just all kinds of chemistry shooting <laughs> on the same page and everything. Oh, God. I mean, we are having the same conversation. Okay. Yeah. So it's tell me about this. All right. Pay attention. Yes, I'm sorry. Because I want to yeah. ask you a question. Is, question. is it my turn? Okay. Um, okay. So you come in and you're jamming with these guys. Yes. And then it turns into something more. How? What is your mindset going into a band that has such iconic albums had such an impact on the whole genre of heavy, heavy metal. Right. And now you're going to go out and do gigs where you're singing the songs. And I've heard you say in other interviews, you knew going in, you'd be probably one of the most hated singers. I did say that. Around. That, that so, was a Facebook post I made. It is. So yeah, it how? Was, yeah, about, it's supposed to be about somebody else, but I was actually talking about because nobody knew. It's like, <laughs> well, I'd hate to be this guy. That's how it started. Yeah. So. so going in, were you apprehensive at all? Were you... Um, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I don't, I don't really get nervous about that type of stuff. Cause I, I knew I had played with Vinny and Jimmy before, uh, we played with George Lynch for a tour, right? a couple tours and, um, and him and I would talk about it, you know, on the bus, I'd be like, what's, what's Vivian doing? You know, he's like, oh, he's not interested, you know? And, uh, and then now we, we got back from that tour and then we, him, me, him and, and uh, Vinny and Jimmy got together to, uh. He had this band called the Hollywood All Stars, and we jam with that band every now and then. And so I knew those guys. So when he contacted me about it, it wasn't. It was just my bud, you know, contacted me about going to jam, you know. Yeah, friends. But you know, so it was really for me. It was only one guy who was in the room that was kind of 
I never played with that guy before. I was like, well, this is going to be cool because, you know, I was a fan of the band and, right. and uh, you know, and, and it was a very special thing. I was one of those fans that was kind of waiting for this to happen and I was going to be the first guy to see it, you know, so, yeah. and even if it, and there was no promise that it was going to go anywhere, you know, um, and I had a session that day, if I remember correctly, I had a session. Yeah, he only came town. in for a short yeah. time and then he had to leave. I had to and get permission to leave, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Blew us all away, you know. And then, Phil, you had to come in. I mean, obviously, um, Jimmy passed away. Yeah, Jimmy passed on. And How was it for you to come in and have to pick up that that role? Um, I remember thinking at the time and probably saying a few times that it was, um, it was a sort of a, a bit of a, a bittersweet experience. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, of course, there was a great deal of sadness about Jimmy passing on. Sure. And at the, on the other side, I was very, I was very happy and, and to be honest, uh, honored and I felt privileged that I could, you know, help sort of push his legacy forward on this album because he put so much into it and talking to everybody who was involved in the album, not just the band, but people around, that this was something he really really was fo- was focused on in a great way and it was the sort of center of, of of everything he was doing so it obviously meant a lot to him and uh we had been friends uh for a long time oh Jimmy okay and I. oh yeah and so yeah yeah when i in fact when i first moved to la we lived <laughs> he, together so he stayed oh wow <laughs> jimmy's party house <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a party house <laughs> My mom might see this. <laughs> no, I said partly. Oh, partly, partly, partly house. The partly house. Partly house. So yeah. partly. Yeah. In, partly house. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, seriously, uh, we we were friends, and 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 so again, this was a, um, you know, I felt this was something I could do for him. Yeah, you that's know, actually he, really cool. You know, be able to bring these songs to people, because um, Jimmy had finished the record and hadn't really had only just started to do shows and bring the music that he cared about so much to people, and then this was you know something I could help carry that forward at least for a period of time. Yeah. And uh, other than that, of course, we all get on very well. Vinny and I have known each other for a long, long time. You know, when I played with Ozzy, um, uh, Ozzy and Dio, I don't know what ever happened between the, the two of them. Right. It's not really relevant, but. The bands for Ozzy and for Dio were like kind of sister bands. We were like counterparts. So there was a there was a great relationship between the musicians who played with Ozzy and the musicians who played with Dio. And so that was the essence of the, the beginning of the relationship that I had, you know, known Vinny. You've been through all of the history. We won't rehash it, but you've been through all the changes and challenges. Looking back, doing this now, do you come at the music from a different perspective? Uh, no. It's like what's cool about this band is the way we wrote and even going back before Dio with Black Sabbath. When we got I joined the band, the first album we did Mob Rules, we went in a room together and jammed riffs. Nobody had songs. Nobody came in with a song. And uh, that's the way that band worked and it made great music. Second album was like that. Holy Diver. It was like seven o'clock at Sound City. And we smoked a lot of pot. And I didn't drink. His pot. mom's watching, maybe. <laughs> I said we had pots. We made pasta. Oh yeah, that was new. We made pot roast and all sorts of things. So it was like boys' club, boys' night out at seven o'clock. We go to Sound City. And we just whack the place. We're playing pinball. Take the glass off. Make ramps so you can't lose the ball. Hey, you want some candy? You know, throw the machine on the floor. They let us do all this crazy stuff. One time my brother rehearsed next door, the Vanilla Fudge, and I came out and said, hey, let's lock them in. We put all our cases up to the ceiling so they couldn't get out for a while. <laughs> he got pissed off because they had to use the bathrooms and down the hall. So anyway, it was just fun. Yeah. And then when we started doing this, uh, the first writing for Heavy Crown was just me, Jimmy, and Viv a couple times, and then Andy came down, and it was like anything goes. There was nobody there to go, no, that sucks, and that. You didn't walk on eggshells, it was whatever you felt. And the same thing, uh, uh, when we got Phil in the band, the gigs were great, but then we didn't know how it was going to turn out writing with Phil. Phil's in from the same family, pretty much. We're all family, and it was just like nothing changed. Yeah, and we just, very natural fit. stuff yeah. just came out. Yeah, we wrote quick. Sounds like it. We'd go in and write oh, two okay, songs and three songs in two days, and then we'd send it to him and 
stuff he comes up was incredible. And then when he came down, it was even better, you know, because he's in Vegas, we were in L.A. So uh, it's just all organic. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just curious. You guys have all been in the business for a long time. Um, going back to when you were young, what was, do you all have a defining moment where you knew this is what you wanted to do? I'm still young. So. <laughs> <laughs> like taking up music and, and really thinking about it as a career. Was there somebody in particular, not necessarily a musician, but somebody that influenced you or you got you started on your first instrument? Or? Well, me, it's easy. My brother your was brother, yeah. 11 years old. I mean, I went to shows with the Vanilla Fudge. 3,000 people, 5,000 people, Led Zeppelin open for him. I was a little kid. Yeah. I looked at this and, oh my God. And before that, he used to rehearse in the house in Brooklyn with his other bands. So I was a little eight, nine year old kid with this was my entertainment. Yeah. A live band in the, in, the, in the living room. And I was like, crazy. I want to do this. And what about you? Uh, I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't really say. I, you know, it's, uh, I, I think I had a little longer of a fight than these guys did, but it was always. It was just never a question, you know. I think I decided when I was 12 what I wanted to do, and and I guess I still have the same mental capacity and, uh, <laughs> and maturity level as I did then. I mean, was your family supportive? Did you, uh, was your family they musical? Or? Supportive, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you like, define supportive. No, my parents were great. You know, they they were they were great. My father, you know, he built us a practice, a, a studio in the backyard cool. to get us out of the house. You know, he had a, <laughs> yeah. like an acre and a half of property, so he. Put a garage that was far enough away from the house so he could, you know, watch TV. Nice. On nights he comes home from work. So, uh, so yeah, I, I guess it's it's just always been something that, you know, I never really wanted to do anything else but, you know. So, and now I can't, you know, it's like what what do you do now? You know, when you're you 73 years old and you can't, you know, <laughs> you know, you can't be a bike messenger now. So. <laughs> oh, and so me, um, I think it was when um, when I got a phone call from. Uh, from Vinny asking me if you wanted to be in this band. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's good. Right. Yeah. That's good. Before no, that, was, Phil was working at Ralph's, right? I, I was, yes. No, yeah, no. Between More that and NASA, that. you know, so. <laughs> the head uh, that would be fries out here. The head <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you weren't musicians, what would you all be doing? Uh, you know, I was on my way, I was on my way to, be, to uh, being a doctor. I was going to pre-med, so. Go no it. way. But and I played instruments my whole life since I was very small. I had a classical training and uh, played classical instruments. Um, and I loved early, early rock, rock blues music. I loved Beatles. I loved all of the same the things that really influenced people. But I think the definitive moment when I thought, oh, you know what, I want to do that, was something. Um, was seeing probably seeing David Bowie on Top of the Pops mm. in 1972. Oh my God! I used I lived in Scotland, oh, so I watched Top of the Pops with right. ABBA first broke out okay yeah we used to watch all yeah, those bands those yeah. guys uh, uh what were their names that was their names well bjorn was one of them yeah bjorn yeah, and uh, agnatha and... one bjorn every day over there right? <laughs> <laughs> oh that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> but, but that was probably the moment i mean seeing that i think was it was so it was such an uh, uh, impress impress what's the word i'm impressionable yeah, I'm not really impressive. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Pressure. Impressive moment. I think seeing seeing that, and it was just, and from there it was, it was Mark the Hoople. It was yeah. sweet. It was all the bands. That sweet. Came we just interviewed that. them. We talked about Queen. Top of the Pops. Yeah. Yeah, and and then of course all the, the rock bands as well, which which were a little bit more off the beaten path, the Zeppelins and the, you know, Deep Purples and all of that stuff. So. Well, you guys, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I know you got to get ready for your show. We're very excited. Last question. You guys are heavy metal guys, but I want to know what's the most embarrassing thing on your playlist? Like when you're alone and you're listening to music, what's the one embarrassing song or artist that you people wouldn't expect you to listen to? <laughs> I mean, I don't... A Debbie Gibson song's pretty good. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I... Like, what, what do you got? <laughs> like, do you guys rock out to all heavy metal, or do? Or no, no, I listen to all it. kinds of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I listen to everything that's. I listen to everything from almost, you know, hypno trance stuff to to heavy rock to hard rock to, you know, so songwriters. A lot of girl songwriters that I like, like Amy Mann and people like. I love that, Amy Mann. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 No, not at all. I'm just saying it's I'm very thinking, diverse. I mean, yeah. there's nothing I don't. I really don't like, and you know this guy's amazing because he he comes in with 
with some influences and stuff that you you know I would never think of. And you say, hey, if you heard this track, you know, and he'll play some some current hip hop thing, and there's, there's something really cool going on in the vocal there, a really cool bit of phrasing that you could easily throw out, throw the baby out with the bathwater if you just dismissed a certain sure. style of music sure. without going and, and giving everything credit. And I, you know, that reflects, I think, in what Andy does. You know, he comes up with well, different, fresh ideas, and not just rehashing the same typical ideas that you find in one genre of music. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you can pay me later. Well, there's nothing. Yeah, yeah there's nothing embarrassing about that. Yeah, I was hoping I mean, somebody yeah. had something really. I listened to the B52s a little I love the B52s. Well, then I listened to Cheryl Crow for a while. Was now I don't all... listen to anything because my ears are fried. What about Seal? I was like wanting to see if somebody listened to Justin Bieber. No, I, oh, my I think God. Seal would be the most. Uh, I listen to Seal. I watched I Leave It to Beaver. Like I love Seal. Seal. In Oasis. I Oasis. love that show. What? Let me no, tell you. Leave it to Beaver? Wait a minute. I grew up watching Leave It to Beaver as a kid. I actually did too. Okay. I love it now. I, want, I got six DVDs of it. And I got to meet them at the uh, Chiller Theater <laughs> show last year in New York. And they still had their shirts tucked in their pants, like on the show. Stop it. <laughs> but they were going to, the, the drummer from Black Sabbath wants to meet us. <laughs> Be Beaver and Wally. When I met them, I was like, hey, oh, cool. I got that's a, a bucket list moment for you, right? Yep.